Why, hello again. Welcome to another edition of Truth, Justice, and the NBA. Of course, the NBA playoffs 2015 style. On the previous episode, you might remember that we talked about the Eastern Conference playoffs as far as its series openers. Well, there are four series openers to talk about in the Western Conference uh, this time. And I do know that even as we speak, game two between Dallas and Houston um, is underway. Um, but we need to go ahead and get these Western Conference um, post games on for game number one. Uh, just in case you didn't get an opportunity to watch them over the uh, previous weekend. And, of course, this is Truth, Justice, in the NBA for April 21st of 2015. Houston proved one thing. James Harden, the beard, does not necessarily have to have uh, one of those great shooting nights and one of those 30-point nights, which we're used to seeing him doing, especially this year in his candidacy to try to become MVP. But he can hurt you in other ways. One, he can still score, okay? He can get to the free throw line and against the Mavericks game one, he got there uh, quite frequently, uh, 15 attempts from the uh, charity stripe and made 13 of them. So it led to him having a 24-point night, even though he didn't shoot particularly well from the field. And also did a good job in getting other players involved. In fact, give credit to both Dallas and Houston in that game one for uh, getting a lot of team involvement. You know, balance. Both had uh, seven players in double figures, but it was uh, Corey Brewer. That's right, Corey Brewer in the fourth quarter. Um, who really made the difference, you know, because Dallas, give them credit for making, you know, a couple of runs in the game. You know, Houston had, you know, double-digit leads more than once, and, and Dallas at one point was actually able to take the lead in the second, and then they made things interesting early in the fourth, and then it was Corey Brewer, you know, with the uh, foul difficulty that Dwight Howard, you know, was, was facing throughout the game, and besides Harden, somebody from Houston needed to come through when things got tough, and, and certainly uh, Brewer did with 13 of his 15 coming in that final frame. So, you know, Houston 118, Dallas 108, uh, one game to none. And if you're looking uh, for some bright spots for the uh, Mavericks, Tyson Chandler, you know, the veteran, you know, the, who they got back from New York uh, just recently, uh, he was a monster on the board and probably was a key factor in Dwight Howard getting foul trouble in that first half. You know, he had three fouls early on to Dwight as well as a fifth foul early in the fourth quarter. And those were some of the things that uh, definitely Houston has to uh, clean up uh, in order for Tuesday's game uh, to go 2 nothing Houston. And that, that's the thing. Dallas can feel good about the rebounding um, ability and the uh, rebounding performance of that of Tyson Chandler. Davitsky, you know he's going to get you points. He did. You know, losing cost was 24 in that game. But uh, in my opinion, if, if you're looking for um, some sparks, for Dallas, naturally it's got to come from more than just those two guys. And you wonder, because from what I heard, um, you know, Chandler Parsons probably wasn't going to play tonight anyway. He's had back issues and only had 10 points in uh, game one against his former team from South Texas. So Houston up one nothing. We'll see how things continue to uh, materialize um, in this series. I thought this was a series that could go seven games and still can. Um, and But it probably won't if we continue to see Houston be balanced and if Dwight Harry can stay out of foul trouble despite his five blocks in that game. Well, one thing is for certain, the Portland Trailblazers right now, simply put, don't like the tempo that's being played against the Memphis Grizzlies. These are two contrasting styles of what I call the MASH series because both teams are injury prone. Uh, the Blazers like to go up and down the court. They like to be that high scoring team. And Memphis one of the few teams in the NBA that is more comfortable with the half court style um, they could settle for winning a game in the high 90s, maybe low 100s, as long as they can keep opponents in that low 90, maybe even high 80 range. Well, give credit to uh, Memphis because in the battle of injury-prone teams, it was the Grizzlies that came out in the end uh, for the victory. The Trailblazers, simply put, have to get better production from the backcourt. And Damian Lillard, one of the rare times where you'll see this fantastic you know, point guard, I believe it's his third year now, just flat out disappear as far as consistency from the field. Um, he was just flat out terrible as far as shooting the ball. Um, so they've got to do better than getting 5 of 21 shooting from Lillard. Um, you know, Marcus Aldridge, one of the few bright spots um, over the weekend in that game one loss for Portland. He had over 30 points. He was a rebounding machine as well. But simply put, um, with, you know, with Mike Conley of Memphis, you know, he'll play in paint, but despite the fact that he's going to have foot problems throughout the series and more reliability on Udro, who had over 20 in that game, but it looks like Udro's going to be playing just as many minutes as Conley. 
you got to think that Lillard can take advantage of that, but did not in game number one. He had problems. Again, both teams just, just injury riddled. We'll see if Aaron Aflalo, who was acquired from Denver in that midseason trade, we will find out if Aflalo uh, can, in fact, go. He had injury issues. You know, Mick Batum, he's playing, you know, he's playing with injuries as well. McCollum uh, did not do much as well. CJ McCollum did very little in that game one effort, but you know, he got hurt against the Thunder um, a couple of weeks back. So, the bottom line is Lillard and McCollum have to do better than 6 of 29 from the field. And the front court of Memphis, you know, both Gasol, um, Mark Gasol and Zach Randolph, double figures in, um, in rebounding as well as points. And they don't have to have a big point night in order to win. They just have to make sure that, that you don't. And for Portland, um, it needs to be up-tempo. And if it is, and if Lillard can bounce back, and you have a feeling he will, then game two could be interesting. A lot of people still feel that this is going to be a seven-game series, but if uh, Portland plays the way they did um, from game one, they play that same way in game two, um, this thing may not even get past five games. Now talking about San Antonio and the Clippers, and a lot of people are going to be saying San Antonio's in trouble because um, fourth quarter, they, they let the game get away from them, and Chris Paul was spectacular from quarter one to quarter four, one of the better playoff games we have seen him play. Um, he had over 30 points in the game. He was distributing the ball fantastically. But his shooting percentage from both the field and three-point range made him dangerous. And other players got involved. And Blake Griffin, you know, he missed a good part of the year due to injury. Well, he's starting to get that Blake Griffin look and feel that we have seen um, throughout the seasons. Um, he was spectacular from the field with over 20 points. And even though the Clippers don't have much of a bench, in my opinion, as far as overall scoring quality, the one guy you can rely on is Jamal Crawford who had another fantastic game. Remember the Clippers, um, their last 15 regular season games, they lost just one of those, and that was to Golden State, and they played them pretty competitive. So you can say the Clippers are getting hot at just the right time, over 50% field goal shooting, and the Spurs were just under uh, 40%. you got to think the Spurs, though, in game number two, look, it's not like they've never been down 1-0 in the playoff series before. you got the best coach around right now in Greg Popovich with five titles, and also two veterans that know what it's like to face adversity and then come right back, okay? So I wouldn't expect San Antonio to just lie dead in game number two like it looked like they kind of did in the final few minutes in game number one. And one big indication, just what I said, the field goal percentages, it was basically like Al B. Short would say from the 80s, like night and day, with the uh, Spurs only shooting 36%. You got to think they'll come back better. And if you are a Spurs fan, you know that Tony Parker and Daniel Green are going to do better than the combined 6 of 22. And the bench, which was supposed to be a strong point uh, for the Spurs entering the series, it has been in years past against virtually everybody they've played. Uh, you got to think that Boris Diaw and Monte Ginobili are going to do better than the combined 5 of 22. I mean, come on, guys. You're veterans. you got to play like it. Um, if there was a bright spot as far as performance for the uh, Spurs, Kawhi Leonard, he led the league in steals, had four the other night and 18 points. They can build off of that, but he also had four turnovers as well. And Tim Duncan had a, had a pretty modest night with a double-double, uh, but was not a big point machine. So we will find out also, too, for San Antonio, the health of Tiago Splitter, um, who's, I believe, battled a calf injury. He played, but only 10 minutes in the other night with just four points and just two of five shooting. His status is very, very important because they're going to need all the help they can get, especially from this uh, veteran out of Brazil. And then finally, um, New Orleans at uh, Golden State. We're going to review quickly games one and two since game two is played on Monday the 20th. First in game one, Golden State got out early, and uh, Stephen Curry, who I believe will be named MVP this season, was a big reason why with his 34-point effort. Um, you saw how well he played, and um, Andrew Bogut, um, contributing as well, both rebounding and scoring, and Clay Thompson. This is the biggest reason why Golden State has a shot at going all the way is because you know Curry consistently can get you over 20, and Clay Thompson has had games this year where it doesn't seem like he can't ever miss from both inside and outside the three-point arc. Um, Anthony Davis, boy, his first playoff game, how about it? He was amazing with 35 points. His stock just continues to climb higher and higher and higher. You got a feeling that you know, you know, when LeBron James, you know, decides to step down in a few years, it'll be he or Kevin Durant that will be known as the best player in the league just based upon what they're doing. And Davis, you know, he features that ability to block shots too, so he's more of a defensive menace than Durant is. Biggest difference between the Pelicans and the uh, and the Warriors is the fact that Curry has more weapons around him. And simply put, even though the Pelicans are a young team capable of bigger things down the road, Davis just simply doesn't have as much firepower him 
firepower around him than that of Curry. Um, you know, game number one, the veteran, you know, uh, Quincy Pondexter, the ex-Grizzly, um, had 20 points in the game. But the, the bottom line is this. Even though the Pelicans are a pesky team and don't quit, that, that fourth quarter when they were down big time, they at least had a ferocious comeback, got the lead down to fourth a minute ago. But they're like that marathon runner that, um, you know, what well, times had that big, big kick, but eventually were running out of gas, and that's the way the Pelicans were in game number one. And game number two was just the opposite, by the way. You know, in game number one, the Pelicans were behind big early. In this one, they were actually ahead by a dozen points at the end of the first quarter. But Stephen Curry, he may not have had as many points in game two as he did in game one, but still had over 20, and still he was getting other players involved in that uh, game number two. So the Pelicans, game number two, had over 50. Second half, though, they were stymied with only 35 second half points, and that's just not Pelicans basketball. Um, it's, it's, it's a team that's still on the rise, but a team as well, they're not going to win too many games when they're scoring less than 100 points. And rebounding edge went to Golden State in game number two, 49 to a 42 edge. So the bottom line is that more players, um, in my opinion, from um, Golden State are, are, are getting involved besides Curry, and simply put, more help is going to be needed uh, for New Orleans if they are able to at least get one game in this series. But they have a legitimate shot in doing it in games three or four, but really it's not a question of if, but a question of how early uh, Golden State can close out the series up two games to none. That is my look at the uh, Western Conference playoffs up to this point. We'll have another update. It's going to come a little bit later in the week in which we will talk about uh, the Eastern Conference. And even though this is a Western Conference show, um, a quick update on Coach of the Year. That, no surprise, although it was a closer vote than I thought to Mike uh, Budenholzer of Atlanta. They barely made the playoffs a year ago, and this year, easily the top seed, thanks to a starting five that has gotten terrific balance this year, including a uh, three-point shooting leader for the season in Kyle Corver. Hey, he was big in game number one against uh, Brooklyn. My next show, though, we're going to deal with the Eastern Conference once again and talk about quite a few uh, game number twos, including the matchup on Tuesday between Boston and Cleveland. Thanks for being patient. And again, we'll have more shows on the NBA rolling out soon. Thanks for watching Truth, Justice, and the NBA. Ciao.